Hello, everybody. I'm Tim McNiff, and welcome to the Let's Play Hockey podcast presented by the Let's Play Hockey Expo. The Let's Play Hockey Expo, the largest consumer hockey show in the land, is back for 2022. The Expo is going to be held March 11th and 12th at the St. Paul River Center, coinciding with the Boy State High School Hockey Tournament. The Expo is sponsored this year by your Minnesota Wild and by True Hockey. So mark your calendars, hockey fans, and head downtown for the latest and greatest in the hockey industry. Great atmosphere, apparel, interactive celebrities, and so much more from some of the top brands in the business. The Expo is happening March 11th to 12th at the Let's Play Hockey Expo. It is a show that you surely do not want to miss. This is episode two of the Let's Play Hockey podcast, and despite the fact that the NHL has decided to pull their players out of Olympic competition, the games go on, and as you might expect, Minnesota will once again be well represented on the ice. Nine players with ties to Minnesota will be competing for both the United States men's and women's hockey teams, and we are honored to have one of those players joining us today, Kelly Panic from Plymouth, Minnesota, now a two-time Olympian, joins us for this edition. Kelly, we want to thank you for making the time to speak with us. And I just want to be the first to say, at least from my point of view, congratulations on making your second Olympic team. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I remember running into your mom while looking for Christmas trees prior to, uh, uh, so this would have been 17, I guess, going to 18. And and uh, and she was a mess. She <laughs> we were also at a coffee store and everything. And we asked her about, oh, how's Kelly doing? Oh, I don't know. I just want it to be over. Your mother was like tortured through this whole process. So I'm just I'm just wondering, um, can you take us back to your initial reaction when you found out or perhaps knew that your spot was safe on this team? Yeah, um, we actually got pulled. They had kind of sent some weird messages to our team, and it was about, hey, come back to the rank. We have a team meeting, and we were all kind of okay. Like, what's going on? Um, it wasn't necessarily time we were thinking that you know these roster decisions were going to be made. Um, so then when it happened. Um, we were just all in the room together, all 23 of us that were named to the team and kind of got told that, Hey, this is the team. You're on the team. Look around. These are your teammates. Um, these are the people that we believe are going to bring back a gold medal for, for our country, for our program. So it was, I mean, it's surreal. Like it's something that it's, it sets, it hits you a little bit there. And there's obviously, you know, those high emotions, um, some relief in there too, just because it's a long tryout process. Uh, but then also refocusing, hey, we got to still get to work. The job's not done yet. It's one thing to make the team, but this team has never settled for just being there. We want to win. So, And then there's obviously the more milestones, getting the the big announcement, the public announcement at the Winter Classic was fun, a great experience to share with our team as well. And then once we get there, it'll set in a little bit more. But it's still crazy to think about. I mean, even you introducing me as a two-time Olympian feels a little surreal. Yeah, just going back and looking at some of the names and reading the bios uh, of, of some of the women who've done this, I mean, you're in pretty uh, exclusive company. You know, I mean, that, that really says something about it. The first time you made Team USA, you were a student at the U of M. You took an Olympic redshirt year. And I remember talking with you about that. You're like, yeah, in the past, you know, I'd go to class and everything. And then I would, you know, go to practice. Now it's like, I don't go to class, you know, and you were just like working out for the team. And it was pretty funny. So I'm wondering now you're an adult with a J-O-B and training yet full time. Did you find it easier or perhaps more difficult to go through the process a second time? Or was it just different? Yeah, I think uh, the easiest way to say is it's different. I think especially for it being my first time last go around, um, you're a little naive to kind of what goes on and like the pressure and the stress, which is a blessing. Like that's why I think having rookies on an Olympic team is huge because they don't really know what to expect. They kind of still are wide eyed about it. Whatever is needed, they'll do. Um, they don't have those same kind of like scars, I guess, with it all. So this time is just different, like knowing kind of, there's a lot of stress that goes into it, a lot of pressure, um, a lot of different things that are kind of in the back of your mind through it all. And then add to the fact that this is my job. So it's, uh, I kind of equate it to like a, a guy in the NHL, his rookie year, you see a lot of great players, you know, come out their rookie year because they're like, this is awesome. This is my dream, everything I've worked for. And then their next year, their sophomore year isn't as, as great just because there's a lot more going on. Like your performance ties into your pay and gets how you, you know, make a living. So it's just different, but I, I will say I'm very blessed um, to be training here in Minnesota just because we have such a great group of post-grad players on the team or in the program. So that was one thing that made it a lot easier um, within the last four years, basically, after I left college, 
you know, they're the motivation to get to the rink, work hard, push each other, um, work out those days that it gets long and tiring. Um, being there with them is huge. I think sometimes people, even in the hockey world, get the opinion that, you know, you guys come out every four years and then you go back into a box or into a, into a, on a shelf or somewhere, they put you on the shelf and they only take you out in four years. You're working every day, you know, and, and, and there's been a lot with the pandemic. I'm going to come back to that. I, I want to just uh, ask this question because I had the opportunity uh, through family friendship to go to your brother's graduation party. And that was after you had won your gold medal. And I think everybody at that graduation party wore that gold medal that day. And the, the last person who seemed to be concerned about where it was or who had it was you. So I'm wondering, uh, and I've had some you know, time, you know, some water under the bridge. What did winning a gold medal do for you, if anything? And do you think it's had a lasting impact on you? That's a good question. Um, I think like as a person, I don't think it changed me um, just to the standpoint of you know, hockey is something I love to do. It's something that I, you know, it's my job. I would consider it as my job now, um, but it doesn't necessarily define who I am. So I think winning or losing isn't, you know, I try not to let it be who I am. Don't get me wrong. I am, I hate losing and I absolutely love winning. Um, but I think the, the best part about that, you know, winning a gold medal is being able to share it. And that was something, I think it was Angela Ruggiero after, um, you know, we'd gotten the chance to spend some time with her, uh, in the build up to 2018. And she said, share your medal. Like, you know, when you win, bring that gold medal back and, you know, share it with people, let as many people touch it as you can, because it means so much to them. And that's what means a lot to me. Um, and I, I completely agree with what she said. It's, it's that cool moment when other people see it and they're like, wow. And like, it's that astonishing, they're like it's heavy. This is heavier than I thought. Or is it real gold? Like asking all the questions that everyone asks. I um, mean, even now, like if I brought it out, there's still people like, in my life that maybe they've never seen it just because I don't wear it quite often anymore. But, um, <laughs> you know, even now, like when they see it, like it's still really cool for them and it reminds you how special it is. And I mean, it's, I don't, I couldn't tell you how many people in the world have won a gold medal, but to be in that group is, is pretty special. For sure. I remember uh, doing an interview prior to the 2002 games with Neil Broughton and I asked him something about the medal. He goes, you don't want me to go get it, do you? And I said, no, no, that's okay. He goes, good, because I don't think I know where it is. It might be in a sock drawer, but I'm not sure. So I'm just like, okay, you know, not, you know it's interesting how people react to that. You have had four years. I'm wondering, you joined that team, as I said, you took an Olympic red shirt from college, you know, so you, and then you had a great success at the University of Minnesota. I mean, from your high school, right to the U of M, you were just on this roll. You make the team and you've got women on there who are married, you know, I mean, who have lives, you know, and everything like that. Four years later, the composition of this team has changed. It's different. I'm wondering, how have you grown both as a player on the ice and do you think as a person since you helped uh, Team USA win that gold in Pyeongchang? Yeah, I think starting with the on-ice stuff, I think just having a lot more ownership of the results that our team has. I think, you know, my first few years, I mean, it wasn't even a full year that I had made the team and then we were at the Olympics. So I think I was really just kind of committed to doing whatever the team needed me to do. And, hey, this is my role, be a third or fourth line player, um, do your job and follow the lead of the players around you and do your best, bring your roles, bring your skill set. And in that way, it hasn't really changed much. It's still that's still what, you know, my role on the ISIS is to bring my skill set and to be whatever the team needs me to be. But in the last, you know, three, four years, I feel like it's just changed in terms of, hey, maybe I'm put in more of a scoring position. Maybe I'm on, you know, power play. I, I tend to kill penalties more now than I did before um, being on the ice in key situations, being depended on. Um, and not that I wasn't in 2018, but it's just that feeling of being, you know, more relied upon. And then I think the big thing too is, understanding that in 2018 we had so many great leaders to look around the locker room at you know Megan Duggan the Lamoureux um and you know it's still the ones we have Hillary Knight Kendall Coyne Schofield Grant Decker Lee Stuckline all those players as well that we still have but also understanding that you know that's something that I can bring to the table as well um I tend to be on the more vocal side for our team so just kind of understanding that you know my energy can set a tone and have a presence as well and being more of that leader off the ice and understanding that I'm not, you know, one of the youngest now I'm kind of in that middle. So kind of being a bridge between, you know, our three and four time Olympians and, and our rookies. So you talk about the rookies. I mean, that's where you were the last time having gone through that experience. Did you seek uh, to sort of like play more the role of, Hey, 
I'll show you the ropes or did that something that just happened natural? Yeah, I think it's a little more natural and it just goes with, you know, knowing those players and getting to know the ones I don't know as well. Um, and I think it's just, again, understanding that, Hey, like we trust you. Um, you're really important. Like I, I will never undersell the value that someone who doesn't have, you know, ex the experience that others has, but they still have their own experience that they bring and just reminding them to trust that. Um, at the end of the day, we're a team of 23 and regardless of, you know, how old you are, or what your experience is, you're important to this team and to our team's success. So I think it comes a little more naturally and just but letting them know, Hey, like we trust you, you're needed, you're valued, you're important. Um, whether it's, you know, directly reflected in the amount of ice time you get, we're all professionals now um, at the point where it's whatever the team needs to be successful. Um, but yeah, it's just reminding them that. And then I think also like when the stress, like people are different. So the way that I went into 2018 is different than the other players that were first time Olympians as well. So that's the other cool thing is it's not just, you know, me trying to tell them, hey, this is what your experience is going to be like. This is how you can handle it. There's so many other perspectives as well that, that can be shared with them. So COVID-19, and this is the game changer, as it has been now for years, unfortunately, it has impacted everyone on this planet and continues to wreak havoc on sports of all levels. But it was really tough for you and the women who have dedicated yourself to playing hockey at the highest level as you had major competitions postponed due to the virus several times. How difficult was it just to keep showing up for work, practicing, doing all that, and then losing those opportunities to have the games, which are so rare for you to begin with? And did you ever have your doubts that these games would even happen and that you may lose this opportunity entirely? Yeah. Um, I mean, COVID has been a challenge, obviously. We're fortunate enough that the challenge has been to play a sport. You know, other people have had different challenges with COVID, and it's very sure. – apparent that I mean ours aren't life-threatening and we're very grateful for that and fortunate in that way I think what's been frustrating is that you look around and there's so many other sport sporting events that happen um and it always kind of feels like why why isn't our our sport and why aren't the people that should be advocating for our sport making sure that our events happen and that they can happen safely but that they can happen and I, I think the greatest reflection of it was the 2018 women's world championship or the 2022 women's world championship got canceled you know in January and at that point, the men's U20 tournament was still going on. But the the hard part about it was that it was just a hard cancel and it wasn't postponed. The immediate thing is like with our, it always feels like with our stuff is, hey, let's cancel it. Instead of let's let's find a workaround, let's find a way to make this happen, sure. whether that's now or down the road. And yeah, it gets hard. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that's challenging. Um, like you said, we only get so many games to begin with, um, with the world championship every year. And then some games, you know, usually in the lead up to that. So it's hard to, you know, stay focused and have those constant reminders. It's not, you don't have the same, you know, schedule where it's like you wake up, you have a game, you have a practice, practice the next day, you have another practice, maybe another game. If we don't have that. It's a lot of practicing and it is more time to let your mind kind of wander. But I think that's also like, you know, the people on this team and in this program um, have always been very good at remembering like what the ultimate goal is. And even in an Olympic year, it's, the goal is to push this program forward, push the team forward, push yourself forward in the hopes to win a gold medal, whether it's at, whether it's at the World Championship or at an Olympics. And I think that's always the reminder. And having you know teammates around you that are on that same path as well is huge. Um, and as far as you know, these games getting canceled or kind of having that thought, I definitely did not try to think about it. Um, <laughs> not try to put the positive energy out there for for it, and not let that doubt creep in. And um, yeah. I think that's great. Change is inevitable, and this will be a different team from the one that won the gold in 18, albeit in a familiar role that as one of the two obvious and heavy favorites to win gold. Give us a brief scouting report on Team USA. What should we expect when these women hit the ice? Yeah, I think it's something that we've actually kind of been as a team focusing on, not necessarily like through like conversations, but more on how we are practicing and how we're preparing and just kind of thinking about our team and our style of play. And I think the biggest thing is speed. It's always been a staple of, you know, Team USA. Um, not only just like fast hockey players. We, I mean, obviously Kendall's up there and we have some other incredibly fast players. Um, but just the way we play. And it's really what that comes down to is being on the same page. And you see it, it's just the speed of decision making. And when you know someone has the puck and you know their options and you know where you're supposed to be. And then everyone else can kind of read off that as well. It makes a big difference with how fast you can play. And I think that's something that we've been talking about a lot. And I think – you know, we play a very, uh, I think, reliable style of hockey. And and then the skill shines through in the offensive third. And I think that's what's going to 
hopefully be seen in the Olympics is, you know, playing really good defense, really good in- like integrity behind the puck. And then when we get the puck and get in the offensive zone, you know, making the most of, of our creativity, of our flair, of our skill, um, and hopefully scoring a lot of goals that way. And I think one thing I think that even though we're coming into this Olympics as, you know, the reigning Olympic champions, we did just lose a world championship, which never feels good. Um, and I think having that chip on our shoulder has always been a staple of, of Team USA in this, in this program. So kind of playing with that, that chip on your shoulder with a little bit of fire um, that, you know, not necessarily relying on being, you know, or what happened in the past, what happened four years ago, but making, making history again. I love it. I know your family was able to be there with you in, in 2018 with you. I mean, yeah. your, your, your business, right. Up and through yeah. the end of it, but you knew they were there. Not That's not an option this time, is it? No, I think uh, it was hard enough. I think just getting to China with visas and all that. And then obviously COVID um, that's not an option for them. And I really honestly, who I feel most for is for those players that it is their first time, or maybe it's, you know, it would have been their family, people's family's first time being able to attend. Um, because I know for me, like, it's awesome to be able to go in and, you know, try to find your parents in the stands. Um, but I think they also just really enjoy the experiences and they got to do all the, like a lot of fun stuff and see different events and go to all the fun things. So um, that's why, I mean, I, I feel so bad for just the, the players that whether it's, I mean, you never know if your first is your last or when your last is going to be, but I'm just very grateful that they got to go at least once. Amen. Do you consider yourself a role model? I mean, I, I just... I sent you a picture one time. I went to the arena over there in St. Louis Park and had, I took a picture of my wife, take a picture of me by your jersey hanging in there. I mean, you're you're immortalized, you know, in, in some certain aspects. So wherever you go, you carry that tag. People introduce you, I'm sure, all the time. This is Kelly Panic, Olympic gold medalist. Are you, is it forced upon you or is it something that you you take or just go, ah, that's not a thing? Yeah, I'm sure I'd probably deflect it a lot more than I should. Um, I think I'm pretty aware of, you know, what I can be to people around me, especially younger younger girls playing hockey. Um, I spend quite a bit of time around a lot of high school girl hockey players. So um, just understanding kind of the influence I can have on them and also understanding that it's not necessarily like everyone's dream to be an Olympian. You know, and I, I, I coach at Benilde, so – it's not like all those girls want to even play college hockey. Right. And what I try to tell them is that's fine. Like just find whatever you want to do and that you're passionate about and follow that. And I think that's something that I, I don't think it's ever been like necessarily forced upon me. And it's never felt like this big, I guess like title above my head. But even I remember like, this is a silly example, but when I first got a Twitter, I think I was in high school and my mom was like, be, be careful. Like anything you put on there, is, is on the internet. Like anyone can have it. Even if you delete it, like it can always be pulled up. Someone could take a picture of it, like whatever. And so I've always felt like I've been aware of, you know, what my decisions and actions can look like, not necessarily from like that role model perspective, but just from being a good person. Uh, but I think now just, I understand, I think how much of an impact I can have on, especially, you know, the young girls in Minnesota that, you know, might look up to me or my teammates and understanding as well. Like whenever, I go somewhere I don't just represent myself. I represent my teammates, my family, and everyone that I know. And you've done a great job with it. Um, this next one, I hope you're okay with this next question because this is a subject. I know you and your teammates are focused squarely on bringing home the gold, but I want to address the elephant in the room. Women's hockey at the highest level in the United States and in Canada has been fractured for years at the professional level over a difference of opinion about the best way to move the women's game forward. Just this week, the Premier Hockey Foundation announced a commitment from their board of governors to invest over $25 million in direct payments and benefits to its players over the next three years, including more than $7.5 million in salary and benefits for the 22-23 season. The timing of this is not coincidental. They know where you guys are going. They know where you're going to be, and they know all the attention you're going to get. Yet the timing for you would seem to be ideal personally because, you know, this has gone along with your, your career arc. You know, I mean, you've grown up as this game has grown. It would seem that after the Olympics are over, you could you've said this is your profession, but I know you've had other J.O.B.s because you've used your brain. You've got an education, but this would be your preferred thing. So I'm wondering, 
Is this a game breaker? Is this a game changer? Have you and your teammates discussed this at all? Or is this like something you guys refuse to look at until you're done with business? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we've looked at it too much um, just because we're so focused on the task at hand, um, not trying to disrespect anything that the PHF has announced and um, what their plans are. I just think that, you know, for all of us that are in the Team USA locker room right now, we're just focused on getting the job done in Beijing. Um, I think, you know, I not look, not having looked into it a whole lot, I think uh, from the outset, it obviously is a good thing for women's hockey, um, regardless of if you're a part of it or not. Um, anytime that money goes to women's hockey, I, you can't really complain about it. Um, I don't think on our behalf um, – it changes a whole lot of how we view things or how we've, you know, kind of wanted things to go. Um, and I will say like, I mean, there's a lot of things working behind the scenes that I'm not necessarily part of on the PWHPA side of things. So I, I kind of just, you know, I try not to, you know, ruffle the feathers too much on either side of things, but it's something I think you know, be more of a conversation after the Olympics and trying to figure out where to go from there. But as of right now, it's kind of just is what it is. And obviously, like I said, it's money that's going to women's hockey. And, you know, you can't really complain about that. No. And and I thanks for letting me ask the question because I'm not yeah. trying to, like, get a scoop or ruffle feathers or anything like that either. I figured I knew where you guys are going, but I had to ask because the timing of it seems to me not, not to be coincidental. Um, so, and again, being focused on the task that's right in front of you in the next month, have you given any thought to like what your immediate plans are after the games? Like, have you like got a, cause I know you guys have been known to at the end of these experiences, like rent a big house somewhere and go off the grid. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sure there'll be some vacations. Um, this year is a little different though, just because there is a world championship in August that was added um, compared to last time we didn't have a world championship till the following spring. So it's kind of, you know, if that's people's goals to get back to that and to kind of stay with hockey. Um, for me, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at is let's keep, let's keep the show going. Um, immediately after I will be taking a break, um, the well-deserved break and with some vacation plans yet to be determined. Um, but yeah, it's uh, there's, <laughs> you're asking the bad question with, you know, immediate plans because I know what happens through February. And then after that, I, I will figure it out. Little little sleep and rest involved, I'm guessing, right off the oh, bat. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, Gil. Knowing what you know now about the Olympic experience and being an Olympian, what is the one thing that you're determined to take away from these games, regardless of whether you get a medal and no matter what color it is? Yeah, I think just really um, being present in every moment that we have. Um we leave in a few days to kind of start our whole journey over to Beijing and just kind of cherishing every moment we have with our teammates. Um, when you get your clothes is for the first time is always so, so fun. Uh, even when you get to put, you know, the new Jersey on, we're actually just, I was just talking about that today in the locker room, you know, how exciting it is to put on a new Jersey um, and what it means to wear it. Um, but just being really present, obviously things are a little different with COVID um, and it feels like this entire year, like it, it change the way we had to do things. Um, and even at the Olympics, I'm, I'm sure it'll be different, but just really trying to be present in all those things because it's different. I think everyone's different. I know, like when I think about it, I think about, you know, kind of how the village felt in South Korea. Um, and I know it's going to be different, you know, in Beijing, but just really trying to be present in all those moments and take it all in and enjoy it. Because like I said before, you never know when, you know, it's your last and, I think above all, like, that's why, I mean, like why a big reason why I play hockey isn't, you know, to win a, win medals and awards and championships. Like, obviously that's why you play the game and that's why you sign up for, but a big reason of why I play is to be with the people I play it with and all the experiences that you can have together and all those fun memories to have. And um, yeah, even looking back on my times in college when we didn't win, you know, there's still some great stories after we lost, even though it took a, a few weeks to get over it. So I think that also is what makes us good is being able to enjoy what we're a part of because it is so special. And I think for all of us, we don't think about our past Olympic experiences on a daily basis. Um, but this is kind of the month where you really get to celebrate it. A lot of work has gone into it, Kelly. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I do hope you do know that it's not just Plymouth, Minnesota, that is proud of you, all of your teammates as well, but especially those like you who come from the state of hockey. 
And on behalf of the State of Hockey, we want to wish you nothing but the best in Beijing and beyond. We hope that you're able to play this game of hockey at the highest level for as long as you want to and be fairly compensated for your effort if that's something that you choose and aspire to do. Kelly, I want to thank you for your time today. We'll be cheering you every step of the way. Have a great experience in Beijing. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. That is Kelly Panic from Plymouth, Minnesota, by the way, of Benilde St. Margaret and the University of Minnesota. A reminder, the Let's Play Hockey Expo, which is the largest consumer hockey show in the land, is back on for 2022. The Expo is going to be held March 11 and 12 at the St. Paul River Center, coinciding with the Boys State High School Hockey Tournament, of course. The Expo is sponsored, of course, by the Minnesota Wild and by True Hockey. So mark your calendars, hockey fans, and head downtown for the latest and greatest in the hockey industry, for great atmosphere, apparel, interactive celebrities, and much, much more from some of the top brands in the business. It's March 11th and 12th at the Let's Play Hockey Expo. It's a show that you do not want to miss. This is the Let's Play Hockey Podcast. I am Tim McNiff. And until next time, keep your blade sharp, your head up, your stick on the ice, and we will see you down the road.